Greetings, programs. You are watching another episode of Core Matter. Core Matter, where we take a deep dive into the personal lives of those amazing people who work in front of and behind the camera to help make incredible content for all of us to enjoy. As always, Core Matter is not filmed in front of a live studio audience. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome back to another very special episode of Core Matter. Like, seriously, like, making the return, George and Anya Kayan. Like, I mean, who's been waiting for this episode? I know I have. Like, seriously, uh, we haven't seen George and Anya since, uh, since, the, since season one, right, of Core Matter. And, like, now it's season three. Here we are. Uh, so that, that's, that's so awesome. That's so awesome. I'm, I'm so glad that they're here. Uh, real quickly, though, I want to give a big shout out to my amazing patrons and channel members guys girls oh man you know i'm gonna tell you right now i never thought i would have like patrons and channel members let alone uh continued uh patrons and channel members right and you guys have and gals have like literally uh you've seen me through it all and you've helped me through it all so i mean i can't do enough but to give you a, a big shout out here at the beginning of uh beginning of the podcast right um let me see uh also, I want to give a big shout out to uh, Dr. Joan Savage. Wow. <laughs> Talk about an emotional week last week. I mean, I'll tell you what right now. Uh, whew, I, w I really want to thank jo uh, Dr. Joan uh, Savage for opening up the way she did, right? Uh, talking about all her different experiences and, uh, you know, uh, writing her novel, going to Hollywood, you know, Dominion Media, all the things, you know, of course, all, all her different fears in and between, right? Uh, getting to these different points and back again. If you have not seen that podcast, right, uh, make sure you check it out. I have that link down in the description below right of this video. Uh, make sure you just scroll down there and click on it. it that's an episode. I promise you this season you're not going to want to miss out on, right? So thank you, Dr. Joan, for for, for joining me last week. You, you freaking rock, girl. Um, of course, joining me this week, right? Um, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, jo George and Anya, right? Like, wow. Uh, of like, uh, man, I tell you, um, they've been through some stuff this, uh, this last year, and uh, they kind of share it all. Uh, you know, they, they talk about... Um, George's health, you know, uh, Anya's future, uh, the status of Antillus, you know, uh, wh where they've been, uh, where they're going and where they're at right now, you know, uh, really thankful for that, you know. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's, you know, get to the core matter of Anya and George Kayan. Hello. Hello. Hey, Trey. Hey, hey, hey. There's the man and the girl they are. Man, you guys look good. How are you guys doing? Doing good, man. It's good to see you. Well, I didn't see you yet, but you know, good to hear from you. Well, <laughs> it's 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 up. I, I can see you, so it's definitely good to oh, see okay. you. Yeah. You guys can see me, right? Oh, no, you guys can't no. see me. All right, how about now? Yeah, there you are. Looks good, how, kid. How's it going, man? How you guys doing? Uh, yeah, it's good. You know, it's been... Uh, you know, busy, but uh, every day is becoming a blur, you know? Yeah, man, I tell you. Uh, so, well, thanks for, uh, real quickly, man, thanks for uh, thanks for coming back and uh, doing Core Matter with me, right? I figured we had a lot to catch up on and talk about. And, yeah. uh, I mean, I figured you had a lot to, you know, catch us all up on, right? And, and all that yeah, stuff. I, I, I mean, I'd probably be better if you just ask me a question and I can answer it because... You know, uh, it, basically, my mind's kind of a blank until you give it like some kind of uh, construction, you know. All so, right. uh, like, you know what I mean? Because uh, I mean, I could easily ramble. I mean, God knows I'm a talker, but I'd rather stay on point with you. Sure. You know? So, you know, whatever you want to know or do. Hey, your focus changed. Went to your background. That's what? cool. It's like rack focus. Oh, sorry. I don't know what happened. I don't know what's going on. Is that better? Uh, you're, no, blurry, you're blurry, but your background is totally in focus. Oh, well, that's weird. I'm you know, like in a movie when they rack focus? This is all for you. This is, <laughs> this is, none of this is what they're going to see, you know, on, on the podcast. Oh, okay. So, I mean. Oh, you, I, oh there you go. You're, back, you're back. back. I was going to say, let me find something white here. I can. There you, there you are. are. You're good. 
No, I'm teasing. Well, um, well, cool, 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 cool. I already hit, I already hit the record button. Um, so <laughs> like seriously, uh, thanks for coming back. Thanks for, thanks for you guys coming back and doing core matter with me. We we missed out on 2022, unfortunately, uh, but that's okay. Uh, I mean, we're back for 2023, right? So I mean, so real quickly for those that I mean, I mean, you've got to be at this point if you're on my if you if, if you're on my channel. You gotta be living under a rock uh to not know who these amazing people are but for those that might not know uh please everyone uh guys girls tell 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 the world who who you are and sure. uh let's uh let's start from there okay i'm anya <laughs> and i'm george definitely <laughs> did we get that right mm, I don't think no, so. no, I'm, no i'm george i'm anya there you go yeah the dynamic duo batman and robin as it were right <laughs> So excellent, excellent, and of course you guys do. Uh, well, George, you do. Uh, you're, you're, you know, like, like I always talk about, is considered the godfather of Star Trek fan films. Uh, well, thank you, Trey. Very old. Yeah, thank you. Thank uh, well, you. you know, I mean, as, uh, you've been doing it for a hot second, right? I mean, your films, I yeah. mean, still, you know, and to this day, uh, get a lot of views. People go crazy about it. I know. I know on the channel, right? Like we go crazy for Mama Kayan, right? You know, especially when I bust that trilogy out, uh, which we just finished up again for the third or fourth or fifth time in a row in like a time span of less than three months. I always tell her, by the way, Trey, whenever you mention her and you know, and you yeah. show the work, I always you know, let her know about that. She's very amused by it all. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty cool though. I love it. I just, uh, it's nice to see her get some props, you know? Well, she is, uh, I know she is a fan favorite on my channel, uh, for sure, especially amongst my mods. You know, they just, they just love her. They love her. They love her. They love her. They love uh -huh. her. Um, well, man, I know, I don't know if you want to, and of course, anything you don't want to talk about, we don't have to talk about, but I know, I know you had a, uh, a little bit of a health scare, uh, last year. You want to talk a little bit about that or no? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, essentially, and it's probably something a lot of people can relate to, uh, just, uh. I, I had a um, uh, a wound on my foot that wouldn't heal. And uh, when I went to the doctor, they were basically like, uh, you've got to go to the hospital now because uh, it's an infection that's gotten into the bone and you're in danger of losing, uh, you know, your, your, your big toe, as it were. And then I said, oh, my God. So when I so when I got to the hospital, you know, they always do blood tests and everything. And they were like, well, you're a full-blown diabetic. Your numbers are so ridiculously high. You should be in a coma right now. I didn't, you know, I didn't know. I never knew. So um, so they had a two-part battle, which was to get my diabetes under control in order to do surgery and save my my foot. Um, but the uh, I got blood poisoning. The infection uh, had uh, really got into my bloodstream. I was very ill. I spent... 11 days in the hospital and uh, they were going to use a feeding tube on me. I couldn't eat. It really got bad there. And my poor wife and, uh, and Anya had to go visit me. And I was just really out of it. I was very, I was very ill, high fever. You, you can imagine. Um, and then they just wanted to stabilize me, get my blood sugar down so they could operate. So it was, it was a long time of suffering uh, until they did that. And once my blood sugar uh, got under control. They did the surgery. And then it became, did we get it in time? So as the weeks were going by, I was seeing all these specialists. And, you know, it's scary when, they, when they're when they saying to you, well, you know, amputation is not off the table. <laughs> you know, there was never a moment where uh, everything was just great. And because of diabetes interferes with healing, the wound on my foot just never seemed to get better. And I've been sick since April. So that's a long time. Can you imagine having a wound that has not healed since April? That you know, we're already into the next year. So anyway, not to belittle the point, the wound finally got to the point where it still needs to be healed, but it's on a safer level. So uh, and I, you know, I'm on insulin. I'm on, you know, I was on shots. I was on, you know, I'm on a whole bunch of diabetic medicine now. And uh, so hopefully things are turned around. My diabetes is, you know, considered under control now. My A1C is is considered healthy now, but you know it never goes away. It's not like there'll be a point where it's like you don't have to do anything. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the reason why 
you and I didn't get to do the interview, uh, you know, a couple of days ago. They had put me on new medicine and it wiped me out. And they said there is an adjustment. Everybody's a little bit different. And I took this thing and it, you know, it just knocked me for a loop. But uh, true to their word, though, after about three or four days of taking it, it got, you know, better and better. So now I'm taking it and I, I don't feel, you know, sick, you know. Anyway, the upshot is everything's under control and um, I couldn't do anything for my series, for my Star Trek series while I was so sick. Um, and it's, you know, the problem with a foot wound is you can't, you can't get around too good. It's not like, uh, you know, you hurt your elbow and you can just walk around. I, I was really, really uh, immobile for a long time. And, uh, but I'm on a better diet now, gotten medicine, you know, so think that's why Intellis is starting up again. I'm finally able to, uh, and no pun intended, but I'm back on my feet enough to, uh, to do it, you know, but unfortunately, uh, we had to move the, uh, I don't know if anyone knows about that whole situation. I was going to uh, ask you about that. Move. I was going to say you also yeah. had to. You also had to. Uh, this last year, you also had to move. Yeah, out of your home well, for time, like so many years, right? I mean, you you were there yeah. forever. We, we we were there a long time, and my standing sets or or you know available space for sets was in our uh, apartment. Unfortunately, um, my dad had passed away. And then suddenly our landlords were like, you guys got to move. And it was like, you know, it was like a double, double blow. A double uh, meeting, yeah. yeah, it was just, wow. And uh, the, the thing wouldn't be so bad if we could have moved just anywhere, but we wanted to keep Anya in the same school system. She was just getting ready to start her school and uh, all her friends were being carried over from the previous school. We didn't want to uproot her. And uh, so we were limited in our search and running out of time. We had to be settled somewhere by September. So we had like a month to do all this. And, uh, and yeah, it was, uh, and with my health, you know, being what it was, it was, uh, it was a lot going on. So filming came to a complete halt, obviously. We had to find a new place. Things were so expensive, you know. So it wasn't just finding a place. It was also finding some place we could afford. Right. So, um, we were lucky enough to find this place, but it's uh, it's nearly a thousand dollars more than where we were living, and it really hit us hard financially. Wow! And it's off a main road, and it makes filming impossible. It's, it's the, the constant traffic noise. It just you know maybe something visual you could do, but you know it just wasn't am amenable to filming. So my mom came to my rescue in a way because um, now that dad's gone. I've been seeing her that much more and uh, she wants help around the house and things like that. And I think uh, we saw that much more of each other. And she says, you know, uh, if you need to use the, the your old space to film again, you can. The problem is it's been used for storage for like 10 years. Uh, you know, so you're going to have to clear it out somehow. So when I, at first I was like, sure, not a problem. Okay. I can do that. But when I went, downstairs to my old space it was packed it looked like <laughs> like an ikea there was you know tables and and furniture and you know bookshelves big stuff all your stuff yeah and then my <laughs> old stuff on top of all that um where was that all gonna go so what mom and i've been trying to do is strategize can we get rid of some stuff can we the things that you want to keep where can we put that and i can't build any sets until that space is cleared so that's what the delay is right now. It's going to take it's going to take about a month to, to uh, and that's providing everything is you know uh, ready to go. Uh, once I get to build the sets, that'll be a couple of weeks. That's not so bad. But um, when uh, this Christmas we were visiting family, and uh, just as fate would have it, they were talking about my series. And I was like, yeah, I can't wait to film again. And uh, two people. Um, uh, of my extended family that had never done anything before. They were like, Hey, yeah, if you ever need us, you know, you know, but uh, the problem is they live in Florida. So I was like, well, how long are you going to be up here for? And they were like, Oh, we're going to be here. Like, you know, maybe a week, probably about four or five days. I said, well, if I can come up with something, we'll film, you know, but I'm, I'm pretty good with writing on the fly. Cause I always have ideas in my head. The problem was there was no place to build sets or anything like that. 
So I'm not going to give too much away because you guys are going to get to see it. Uh, but I came up with an idea that I thought was kind of cool based on what was available, based on, you know, you know their availability. And uh, and it was really challenging. It was a little bit harder than it than if I had described it to you. You would say, well, that's not so bad. But mm-hmm. it was like filming has to be done under certain conditions. And it was like the whole world was like, I know you only got this day to do it. And I'm going to make your life as difficult as possible. And everything you can imagine that would make filming difficult, we experienced, you know. It was just crazy. It was absolutely crazy. But in the end, um, we got it done. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I've been assembling it. And, I, and I'm happy with it. But, again, all the problems we encountered during filming have to be, like, overcome, you know. And uh, it's it's been rough. It's been I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say maybe the final scene that we shot will be around maybe 10, 12 minutes long. And I've already put in about 20 hours worth of work. And wow. I still got like another. Yeah, it's just, you know, because you know, you know what the thing is? If you can do your job, edit it and film it, and nobody notices that. They shouldn't notice any technical aspects. But, you know, so the lighting's got to be good. The color balance has got to be good. Sound's got to be good. And then, of course, the editing comes into play about are you telling the story, you know. So all of those elements come into play. So right now I finished the rough cut. I got to go back and do the technical, you know, fix those things that are technically a problem. And then I got to do a final edit to make sure that it's moving along as as best we can. So it's, it's, a, it's a long process. And, of course, as I said in our uh, other video, we, we haven't even begun to build the other standing sets yet. So although this scene will be complete, um, it, we're far from done, you know, it's not like, okay, I finished the editing here. I'll post it next week. It's, it's not ready. It's just not ready yet. But the good news is, um, and I mean, you know, this for yourself, for your projects, it's all about momentum. If you can get it going, if you can get the filming started, get your cast together, that's your first step. And then you got to see what the damage is. You know, when you're off, I mean, it's been like a year and when you haven't filmed, in that long period of time, you know, people have lives, they move on. So you got to take damage control. You got to take stock. Who's available? Who's not available? Do I need new faces? You know, because the overall story is written in my case, but those details, those individual episodes, those scripts need to be always updated, polished, tweaked, you know, and in order to fit in with a greater story. So what we just shot, although it was very currently written, it does fit in with the overall story. I was able to, you know, like a jigsaw puzzle just one piece in the middle, but I, I can fit it in and it'll make sense, you know? So that's, that's kind of where we're at. I like it. I like it. That's how, I, that's how I've always known you, man. Always, always jigsaw piecing everything together, you know? So absolutely. Kind of the uh, nature of uh, low budget filmmaking anyway. I mean, obviously if you uh, have a huge budget, and you representing a studio, you know, all of that time is bought, paid for, and, uh, you know, things are scheduled in, and it's almost a done deal because people have contracts, they're not going to break the contracts. We don't have that luxury at all. It's basically it's basically based on, on friendship, uh, loyalty, also people's interest in a project, and sometimes you have to get to them fast because that interest can wane. You know, one day they could be like, I really want to do this, Two weeks later, they could be like, yeah, I can't. I, I got other things I have to worry about, you know. And even things like filming with Anya. I mean, it's like you got school, you got work, you got extracurricular activities. How does that fit in with our filming? So if, like, Sharb is going to appear in a scene with other actors, that triples the complexity because what are their schedules like? You know, so there are many times where people have not even actually met each other and we've done split screen and put them in the room together. It's all kinds of tricky things. You got to make sure the eye line makes sense. You know, it's and those are the details that the audience should know about. But if you do your job right, they'll never question it. You know, it just wouldn't make sense that somebody be talking to Sharp and looking, you know, like as if the character's eight feet tall. You know, it's like all those little details. And also, I work with people for the most part that have never acted before. I love that. Because they, they go in fresh, they, they, they take direction really well. It's very, like, uh, high energy. You know, they're a little bit nervous. But uh, I love to mold performances. And that's where I get my kick out of, you know, they're giving me their time. 
and it's my job to make them look good. So it's fun. Also, as the years go by, all those family and friends, it becomes more valuable just with the passage of time. You know, so it's current, right? Nobody, you don't think anything of it. Ah, oh, it's well, my friends. But, you know, people pass away, things change, people move away, they have babies. So that footage becomes more valuable because you'll never be able to do that again. So that's where it becomes valuable for me. And I didn't know that when I first started filming back in 78. Uh, you know, those early films were done because I just wanted to make a movie. But then you got into the 80s, then you got into the 90s, and 2000s. And suddenly it's like, wow, they're not here anymore. They're gone or or people age and they change so much that you're happy you captured a moment. That's a It's a weird way of documenting your life. I could see myself through the decades that I don't think I would have ever like paid attention to otherwise, you know. It's not vanity so much as you're kind of documenting your life uh, through these weird created stories. And even Anya, Anya's green, you, you remember the early film with her in it, uh, you know, when Anya's this little tiny baby on her are set and now look at her she's already growing so fast now i know it's hard to tell with sharp but you could tell with the with her character the timeless daughter right not timeless yes that we are you know she's growing up she's getting bigger she's maturing so there's a there's a small window to get everything done while she's this age you know because she's a bit, it wouldn't make any sense for her to suddenly be an adult in the middle of my series when the time doesn't require that you know if my show takes place over the course of two or three years, you got to count for that, you know, unless she's an alien and then, you know, you can make up anything you want. You can say, ah, you know, for Planet X, they grow up in three years, you know, they become 50 years old and you'd have that freedom. I, I'm lucky with Char because as long as Anya wears the mask, you know, it buys me some time. But when she plays the other character, you know, they, you know the clocks are ticking. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I feel like, I feel like here on, on even on our channel or on 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 my channel our channel our channel my channel <laughs> this channel uh she's grown up right before our eyes yeah you know I mean she you know I I we, I, I still play that the uh, the video the you know and like even looking at her right now I mean she looks like I mean it's been two years since she's been on the channel I mean that's I mean are you, yeah. more like more like five right I mean look how look how much more mature she looks I mean it's it's insane guys, guys look, look at, at her. her yeah no you're right and it's funny because you would think by paying attention to time it would slow it down but it doesn't the older I get even if I'm hyper aware of the time it still flies by it does not slow it down it's 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 like a train you can't it's just too big, you know. Uh, the weird thing for me, and and my wife would uh, laugh at this, but I my intention is never to film for years upon years upon years. You know, the intention is to get something done within a reasonable amount of time. But, I mean, you know better than anyone else. Real life has its own agenda. So you could do one of two things. Either you can start a project and abandon it because it's like it's going on too long, or you can kind of roll up your sleeves and say, well, I'm going to stick with it as long as I can. And then the real miracle is seeing it all the way to the end. So I started in 2013 with this particular series. Ten years. I, I never thought it would take this long. <clears throat> because it's not like I did 100 episodes. But it goes to show you how much work and time and effort it takes. But now that we're entered our third season, and I hate to use a cliche, but there is light at the end of the tunnel now. You know, we got about 10, maybe 11 episodes. I mean, whatever it takes. If I need 12 episodes, that's fine. The most important thing is to tell the story. But right now, we have a solid 10. But you never know. Sometimes you might, as you're working on these things, you get an idea and say, oh, that would make it better or that would make it make more sense. So I'm going to make another episode, you know. So that's the plan. But if you were to tell me back in 2013 um, that I would still be doing it in 2023, I would say, well, it can't be the same series. It, you know, it doesn't, that's just crazy. That's a crazy timeline, you know? And uh, it amazes me even. And then, of course, the other side of the coin is when you post something on YouTube, it gives you the date when you posted it. And I look back at some of my early videos, I can't believe, you know, you're looking at, you know, uh, God, 14, 15 years ago. It's like the blink of an eye. And those films are even older. Like my first Star Trek movies, you know, basically... We shot that in late 91, 92, 93. 
and the post editing took us to 94 around 95 and that's when the movie was kind of complete the 90s the 90s yeah so now when i post it even though it's so many years later people think it's only that old they don't realize that it was filmed you know that much earlier you know i mean yeah it's funny because when i made the first star trek movie um and i don't know if i had said this to you it wasn't made for anyone else uh, I was a huge Star Trek fan. Mom liked Star Trek. I wanted just to make it for myself. Remember, this was before I had act, no internet. This And the only way I could show it would, because uh, it was on video, was a theater. So how unlikely was that, that I was going to get my little project into a, a theater? So it was only for me. I wanted to see if I could do it. And the challenge became, can I make a bridge? And, you know, you know, you know all the obstacles. And once I made my paper and tape set, because my, my parents really didn't want me to make anything permanent. They knew if I, would. well, it, yeah, would. First of all, the expense of it, the amount I would need. Also, if I built all this, how long would it stay up? You know, they didn't want that to be there forever. So I, I went to plan B, which is paper and tape. But once I built it and it looked okay on camera, I said, wow, okay, I can make my Star Trek movie. Again, if you were to say to me, well, it's going to be like a four or five year mission making this film, I would have said, no, that's, it can't be. It can't be that long. But it was. And then after I finished the first one, we got it into the theater. We, we rented out a theater. We opened it up to the public. And that was a trip, just seeing people watch my film on a big screen. Uh, of course, it wasn't the director's cut version, which is longer. Uh, it was the original version of the film, uh, which is uh, like maybe like an hour and five minutes or something. It wasn't, you know, as long as it is now, like when you watch it now. Um and then I thought that was it. All right, I had a theater run. People loved it. Uh, whatever, I'm done. And I never intended to do another thing in Star Trek whatsoever. And that was genuinely the feeling. Yeah. And I ended up working on my other project. And then I had the idea about the Klingons because I was frustrated. Um, at this point, Enterprise hadn't aired uh, its episode about the Klingons. And I was really frustrated with, how could you not address this issue? This, you know, Why did the Klingons look different? It, it was a story there. And I took several months of research. I watched everything official. Uh, I tried to read everything I could. And then finally, I just came up with my own theory. But would it hold based on what was already filmed? And the biggest thing, believe it or not, was when they took the original Star Trek, the classic Klingons in Deep Space Nine, and they gave them all bumpy heads with not a word of explanation at all. Suddenly, they look like the movie Klingons. And that's like, well, that's weird. You can't turn around and just say, if, any, if everything filmed is canon, you can't just turn around and say, well, that's just make believe we had a budget back then. It, that that doesn't fly. You showed them a certain way, then you showed them looking different. There's got to be a reason why. And then there was the episode when uh, they went back in time, the Tribbles, uh, uh, their 100th episode on Voyager, and uh, Odo didn't recognize the Klingons. You know, Odo knows all the species. He's a security guy. And then Worf was like, oh, we don't talk about it with outsiders. Again, I know the writers didn't want to give a definitive answer. But Worf always brags about everything Klingon. So what could be so bad that Worf won't brag about it? And also, what could have happened to show Klingons looking that way versus the bumpy-headed way? So that was the basis for my theory. So I will say this. This is not bragging. This is just the results of research. My explanation, when Enterprise came along, they dipped their toe into the pool, but they didn't go all the way. The, they didn't explain how regular Klingons became bumpy heads and vice versa. They didn't account for the fact we didn't see any human-looking Klingons after a certain point. So at least if you watch my movie, if you don't agree with it, that's fine. But you can't say it doesn't fit every single aspect of Klingon culture, why the Klingons you know, became what they were, why the original Klingons became bumpy head. It's all there. And that was not a fluke. That was hard research. Um, and I even took the, uh, it was kind of an offhanded comment by Gene Roddenberry, you know, the creator, when he was like, oh, you know, they were northern and southern Klingons. He just was sick of addressing it back in the 70s. He's like, think of them as northern and southern Klingons, you know, that kind of thing. And I said, hey, that's why in my thing, I said the northern and southern regions of the planet. So I even took what Gene Roddenberry said as kind of like gospel, you know, and, and put it in. So, again, I'm very proud of that. And you know what's funny? I've had how many years now? 2002, that movie was done. Um, uh, the director's cut was done later. But, again, it was essentially the same movie. But 
over the years, I've had so many people uh, uh, try to analyze the film and not a single one uh, could say, well, your theory doesn't work. I've had some people say, well, you know, Enterprise did it. And I would always say, yes, they did it, but they didn't. Can you explain to me how the regular Klingons became bumpy heads? The Enterprise doesn't cover that at all, you know. In fact, they did the opposite. They said, you know, oh, thank you. They they um, they did the opposite by saying, well, you know, they were, it's human DNA. That doesn't account for uh, uh, why we saw no bumpy heads in classic Trek. We know historically why. I'm talking about in-universe. They certainly would have been around if only a small percentage of Klingons got human DNA. And would the bumpy-headed Klingons ever allow the human Klingons to run their empire? It didn't make any sense. So, yeah, again, I, I don't I don't want to uh, ramble on and on about it. But the point is, it's a pothole in the road of Star Trek that needed to be filled. And not carelessly. It needed to be real. And they put me in a real quandary. It's like, if maybe if the Deep Space Nine episode didn't exist, okay, maybe it wouldn't have been so bad. But that event in of itself, and then Worf denying why they changed, there's a mystery there. And if they're not going to do it, well, I'll do it then. You know, as a fan, I have that freedom to, to tackle. I'm not afraid of tackling anything. That's why, uh, moving on to the third Star Trek movie in the multiverse uh, thing, what bothered me so much in The Final Darkness, what bothered me so much was the episode when the, they ended up on the planet with the American flag and the Constitution and the Yangs and the comms. And I, I know it was a budget thing, and it was also supposed to be one of the original pilots of Star Trek. They just decided to do it way later. But that irked me. Even, I think, Spock said the idea of uh, that scale that rates are based on human culture or similarities. He was like, oh, it's highly unlikely. that." So I, I said to myself, this has got to be Earth, but what Earth is it? It's got to be a replica of Earth. You're not going to get an American flag with an alien culture, Yankees and communists. You're not going to get the Constitution signed by the original forefathers. It made no sense. It made no sense. That's why, even though it was kind of a weird cul-de-sac, I did fit it into the greater mystery. I went out of my way to answer that because that's something that just stuck in my craw, you know. And again, fully prepared. If you don't agree with it, that's fine. But you can't argue that at least it doesn't offer some reason, you know. It also explains why Kirk wouldn't have known that. This was a, a top secret thing that had happened and nobody knew about it except Section 31 uh, in my movie, you know, the, my in the universe of my movie. So it covers that too, because obviously if that event was well documented, what I came up with, everyone would know about it. You'd say, oh yeah, there it is, uh, you know. There's uh, the, uh, another version of Earth that uh, we knew about it. So again, that's just where my head's at. I just the kind of person that loves the film, the, the potholes as I call them, in the Trek Road. I'm just disappointed that the people that run these things, they don't tackle them. They shy away from them. They're just so afraid to put a, a name and a number to things, and that's a shame. You know, and then when they do weird things, like they'll add a sister to Spock or, you know, like they, they do weird things. Leave leave the core things alone and come up with your own stuff. You know, it's weird. They're afraid. They're afraid to wander too far out of the Trek forest. I find that ridiculous. I guess it's good for us fans, you know, because we'll tackle it, you know. But, yeah, that's where I'm at. Of course, this week and every week of Core Matter is brought to you by the amazing patrons and channel members right here at the Max World Entertainment YouTube channel. Man, I'm going to tell you right now, this is the time to do it. We are doing, like, they have helped me do so many things, both the patrons and the channel members, um, and stuff is happening. And all I can say is thank you to those amazing patrons and channel members for your continued support, for all that you do, for me, for my comic for the channel, you know, uh, channel members. And of course, uh, patrons, they get perks, right? So it's always, uh, you know, that's a bonus, right? If, if that's what you're into, if you want a perk, or if you just want to help out the channel and if you want to keep on with, you know, the podcast and that kind of thing, that too is appreciated. Think about patron and channel membership right here at the max world entertainment YouTube channel. I feel you, man. I feel you. No, preach, brother. Preach. Let, <laughs> let's hear it all. Let's hear it all. Um, 
Well, you know, you talked about it. You kind of alluded to it earlier. And so let's just go ahead and talk about it right now. Uh, yeah. And that is uh, season three of Antilles, right? Uh, here we are. We've you've started product. You've got started production. Um, yep. You're filming has begun uh you know uh, the health thing sounds like it's getting back on track thank god uh <laughs> moved into a new place um hurrah you know i mean i'm like you know <laughs> um you know uh and now season three you know so tell us tell us what quick can we expect with season three? and dare i say it or ask the question is this the end <laughs> well, I mean, the story was already mapped out. When I created back in 20, I guess it was late 2012, uh, I did come up with this kind of uh, beginning, middle, and end. I always had an overall vision. That The thing was, in the beginning, was how long was I going to expand it? And originally, I know it sounds crazy, but it was only going to be like around 10, 15 episodes. <laughs> but as I started getting into it, I, I said, you know, I need to flesh this out more. I don't have enough time. So let me just make it 20 episodes, you know, and then, yeah. ulti then ultimately it became 30 episodes. Um, but again, I, I always leave that door open in case I need just that a little bit more because the most important thing is to, uh, as the creator of the show, is to get to the ending we want to get to. You know, I don't want to stop just because it's number 30 and, you know, and, uh, you know. So there's nothing wrong with leaving some plot threads dangling, providing they're not too big. Like, for example, if I was ever going to do a future series, I wanted to pick up on those threads. So you could do that. You could say, well, you know, we might not know the answer now, but maybe down the line. But as of right now, until this is self-contained, uh, it's probably going to be the last uh, major series that I'm going to do. It's just getting tougher and tougher as I get older. But having said that, um, I did come up with an idea uh, I don't want to give it away yet because I, I want to wait till Intellis is done and then you'll probably be the first to know. But I will say that uh, my time in the Trek universe might not be over if this uh, little idea that I have works out. It might not be on the same scale as Intellis because uh, I'm almost 60 years old, so I don't know if I want to put in another 20 years of this. Uh, you know, but on a smaller scale, you know, maybe individual movies or individual stories, um, that that could still be on the table because that could work around my schedule, you know, on my own time. There's a little bit of a pressure when you do a series because you got people that are interested in it, and I, whether it's fair or not, they have every right to want that next episode. But because real life is so, you know, it gets in the way, you might take two or three months in between episodes. You know, I'm not, I don't have the luxury of making this my living. This has to be done because it's a passion, so, you know. So uh, so anyway, to answer your question, what can we expect? Um, season three is all about getting the, the answers that the first two seasons set up. It really, you know, there's more adventures ahead, absolutely, but the overall purpose is to answer those longstanding questions uh, regarding Admiral Mox, regarding Varen Frost, regarding um, uh, the captain's health. You know, the captain's been struck down, uh, and, you know, he's, his time is growing short, really, be a cure and what can they do about it? Uh, and also Natalie, you know, is Natalie really alive? Is she missing? You know, that has to be answered. So all of these questions are the backbone of the upcoming episodes, including particularly our season opener. Uh, and because you're only dealing with a limited number of episodes, they have to be at this point. It's okay to string things along. There's nothing wrong with that. But now it's time to answer them, not to shy away. So that's what season three's purpose is. It's really the answer season. Every episode will actually be answering major questions or at least moving the story into the final, uh, like two hour finale kind of thing. You know, everything will funnel everything towards that. And um, I, I think it's time. I mean, if I had my druthers, it wouldn't have taken this long. But the funny thing is all my actors and myself, and um, it's given us time to live with these characters so long that it's like putting on, comfortable clothes and you know like we understand where we are it's not like the, the growing pains are done so other than my guest stars of course you know who hadn't done it before but i'm hoping to get a lot of new faces in while i can that's the other exciting thing i want each episode to feature new people as well as you know sharp and um, my regular cast and uh 
so that's really it. That's what I'm excited about. You know, season three will be like with every episode, an answer, uh, a definitive one too, by the way, you know, an answer that you can, okay, I can walk away from that now and let's get on with the next thing. So that's, that's what we're hoping for. So in other words, questions like, will we see Holt Hulk out again? Is it okay <laughs> to neuralize your enemy? What are the true repercussions of being neuralized? Will there be a, another trial for uh, Captain Allen that he, you know? I have to, I have to tell you something, and it, it's better that we do it over the con like with the video thing because it's hard to write all this up. And and please believe me, this is the absolute <laughs> truth. Uh, I'm always on the search for props. Always, you know, thing, anything that looks like something that could be. Something starts play anything, you know, uh, and it could be cardboard, it could be metal, it could be anything. So anyway, um, I was shot. There was like a toy store uh, many years ago, and they everything was on discount. Like you mm -hmm. know, literally, they, the store was going to close. They wanted everything gone, and they had this MIB neuralizer thing. Now, I'm being very truthful. I had never seen Men in Black. I had no idea what it was, no idea what the neuralizer was. Nothing. Only thing I saw was this prop that had shiny. Stars. It was shiny. It kind of looked like a Federation medical tool. And I only had to alter the, the the middle, like it popped out. Like you could actually pull the top part out. So I just added like a little extra control thing in there, not knowing at all, uh, you know, what M MIB was or what this device was used in the film. So I filmed my episode, still never having saw that. That's why I used it as a hypo in my episode. You know, it's, a, it's basically a very fancy hypo spray uh, because I thought it looked really, that's what it reminded me of. So then I think about what, three years later, I finally saw Men in Black and I, I did the metaphorical like kind of slap in my face because I'm like, oh my God, it's, it's actually so important. It's actually a major thing that they use, although they didn't use it the same way I did. And so when you picked up on it and said, oh, you're neuralizing, I was like, honestly, uh -huh. that was never the intention. You know, it was always meant to be a hypo spray kind of thing you know i mean it makes me laugh now but it was as innocent a thing i just saw this thing as a prop that i could use you know and i didn't give it any more thought than that but then i did finally see uh, i saw the first two i think there's three of them now right or four mibs i saw the first two and again it was like oh my god but you know um the only thing i could say in my defense was i honestly didn't know what it was and i just liked the way it looked and a lot of the things, I mean, uh, one episode um, with the uh, the girl who was a ghost uh, episode, uh, the bad guys using seven. kind of, yeah, seven? it might be episode seven, yeah. Seven, eight. Yeah, the, the bad guy, the bounty hunter guy, he's got like this giant flashlight uh, ray gun. Oh. And the reason why the, we had built an original prop that looked very much more like a ray, but when we got on location, it, it was gone. We had lost it. Ah. It got lost in transit. We never it wasn't in our car. And here we are way on location, very far from home. There was no going back. The filming had to be done that day. I literally went back to my car. I found duct tape. I found these industrial flashlights that we had. That was actually my dad's. I just taped things together. I put like a little light on it right then and there. Yeah, I said, that's your weapon because that we, we have no choice. So yeah, I've got, I've caught slack for that where people are like, oh, why don't you disguise it more? Or you know, you no well, time. sometimes you just you know, low budget filmmaking, go with the flow would be your subtext every time. And believe me, we were just grateful we found a flashlight because otherwise I might have had to invent some kind of weird wrist thing for him. You know, like to like a Boba Fett. You know, when he has like his wrist gun or something. Because what can you do? You're on location. You got your actors, and. I'm usually really good with packing everything. You know, I have a checklist, and this thing just got lost. I don't know. To this day, we never found it. Do not know. I don't know if it fell out of the uh, of the of the bag that we had it in. You know, on the way to walk into the location to film. That's my theory. It must have just fallen out. Nobody noticed it. But what can you do? You know, you, 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 the show must go on. You know, and yeah, I'll take the hits for it. Yeah, it's a it's a flashlight, but. If you it's look at cool the, it's kind of a cool flashlight, yeah. But if you look at, at the in universe thing, and if I'm as the filmmaker say that's a weapon, then I'm hoping you'll just take the leap of you know faith with me and say, oh, you know, it's, it looks like a flashlight, but it's a laser gun. Fine. Yeah, you, know, you know, I showed it firing a laser, so hopefully you'll accept it as that's what it is. But that's the 
that's the real story about behind it. But I mean, you know better than anyone else. Everything you do as a project is a million obstacles that have to be overcome that you don't even want to necessarily have to tell people because then it looks like you're just doing an excuse. Oh, I'm so lame. I used a flashlight. But I know what else could we have done. I mean, literally, it was a Hail Mary time. Now years have gone by, and if someone laughs at it, I can laugh too. No one can uh, rip apart myself more than me. You know, sometimes you get comments, and they, they, they make it look like you didn't notice something. It's like, oh, yeah, I noticed it. But you got to go with what you got, you know. I just try to do the best I can. I try to edit it the best I can, try to find the best talent, I, the things that I can control. I try to give my audience the best quality that I can. Um, and ultimately, the last thing I want to say is um, consistency. I've been invited many times to go to the neutral, you know, the studios, the, the professional sets, um, or upstate New York. You know, James is a fantastic set. The reason why, well, two, I don't have the money for it. Two, travel is just not in the picture and hasn't been for a long time. But the weird thing is, if I went there, right, and I said, oh, this is the Antilles Bridge for this episode. And you saw that kind of level. It's too pretty. It's too perfect. <laughs> it makes no sense. And believe it or not, if you're going to be a fan of my show, it's the consistency. The audience needs to say, this is the universe. This is the way it looks. You know what I mean? And that's what we come to expect. You cannot you cannot do these giant leaps suddenly uh, and pull the audience out. I, I want to I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna jump in real quick. Because, sure, please. Because like, I'm a fan. I know, I know, I know a bunch of, I know a bunch of people on my channel are a fan, and even to this day, bro, to this day when I'm showing your stuff, right, I see it in the chat all the time. I want to, I, I want to visit those amazing sets. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not making it up. Yeah. I'm not making it up. I'm not making it up. No, for real. It, I see it all the time. You know, um especially like from the channel members and stuff and i think they're going to get a big kick uh knowing that you're about to go back to your to the old stomping grounds right where yes, it all began circle. Yeah. you know i mean because that's that's cool how, how did i seriously i mean how does that make you feel i mean like you tell, tell us tell us about these amazing sets that everyone wants to visit real quick well i i'll, I'll give you a paper and tape yeah well here's the funny thing um First of all, it's weird to come back with with dad being gone. It's weird to come back and build those sets again or getting ready to build the sets and he's not there. It's very it's very emotional and it's very strange. But at the same time, um, I think he uh, he'd probably be uh, bemused in his own way about, oh, God, you're still doing this? All right. Uh, but mom has been great. She kind of likes the idea of me being creative and, and keeping her company too. You know, I'm going to be spending a lot more time there. Um, now, as far as the sets go, I don't think this will spoil the magic. No. But the thing is, the sets are built. To with, be taken with, with, down. Well, yes. But when I build the sets, I actually put monitors on what the camera is going to see. So the most important thing is, how does the how does it look on the monitor? doesn't matter how it would look in real life, because that's irrelevant. How is this thing going to film? Also, um, the lighting, the detail, uh, just the way it looks. Uh, doesn't become complete until you put somebody in front of it. So a control panel of itself might not be that impressive, but if you put a, an actor there, you know, working the controls, they're actually blocking part of the set and they're interacting with it and it makes it look that much better. Because honestly, because I'm building simply through the monitor, they, I, the monitor is always on, even as I'm constructing it, you would be amazed about how bad it looks in real life. Now, I'm not knocking myself. It's just the reality of your eye, your human eye would pick up every fault. You'd say to yourself, this cannot be the same set that I've been watching in the series. It doesn't look right. It looks, you know, you know, because, you know, what happens is paper and tape, they crumble under its own weight. And even when you try to fix it, thing, you, you get with like the, the shimmer, the wave. Sets after a while collapse under their own weight. And in sometimes, the middle of the night, well, staring yeah. you to death. <laughs> But some, sometimes it's just not feasible to tear it down and start over again. You can't constantly rebuild these things because the materials are expensive and they wear out. You know, So it's not like I can – the local art store, which I used to get all my stuff, is long gone. So you can't just order online these giant 18 by 24 
boards of a specific material, the way they the look, color. you know, the it's, it's, you know, so it's an illusion, but in the best sense, it's like, it's like the magician thing. You know, you, you see the magical act and you kind of go with it. You say, Oh, it's magic. Even though intellectually you say, no, I know there's a trick behind it, but if you saw them explain it to you, it's always disappointing in a way. You, It's always like, Oh, it, that's kind of obvious. Oh, how did I not figure that out? Or, you know, then once the once the veil is pulled away, and if people saw the sets, the veil would be pulled away. I think they'd be, I think they'd like the overall feel of it. They'd say, oh, it kind of looks like Star Trek, but they'd be amazed of sometimes how small the sets are, or or, or how badly they're they're aging. You know, it, it's all an illusion. I have to carefully light a lot of the sets, um, and again, they don't look complete until you put actors there. If you, the sets were filmed of their own, it wouldn't hold. It, you know, the the veil would be pulled away. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a lot of work to, to, to fake it in, in a way, you know, but I gave myself one little out. I think you had even mentioned it a long time ago. Uh, the, the, the Antilles is a prototype. She's not a regular constitution class. She's not constitution. She's her own belt nap uh, class. She's a prototype. And the reason why I did that again, try to put some thought into it. I wanted to make my own version of the bridge close enough that you'd say, oh, yeah, it's a Federation bridge. But I didn't want to be stuck with it looking like the Enterprise because let's face it. And I'm, and by the way, I'm casting no aspersions. This is not a slight on anyone. Every time everyone uses those professional sets, uh, there's no surprise anymore. You know, no matter how different the characters are, no matter how uh, unique their stories are, you feel like it's the same set. So I wanted to create a bridge that nobody else had. I wanted the, the, to have features and, and a feel that was uniquely mine. And um, that's why I get away with it. You know, she, she's a prototype. She she might be modified into looking more like the Enterprise at the end of her prototype mission. You know, maybe she'll go back to dry dock and they'll be like, okay, we're going to, you know, make it look like every other ship in the Federation. That's fine, you know. Uh, but that's the reason behind it. Again, everything I put on screen there's a lot of thought put, uh, you know, put into it. I don't take anything for granted. Also, let's be real. I can't compete with those sets. I can't. They, the materials they use, the size of their studio that they have, the absolute amazing nature of how they made these things, you cannot compete. But what I can do is give you a consistent universe. I can make it as consistent as I can. And if you're in it, like if you look at it and say, oh, this is too low budget for me, fine, you're free to go. But if you're a fan, I owe it to you as my fans to make it consistent. So you know what that bridge looks like. It should become like your second living room. You know, uh, you can always add new rooms, rooms that you've never shown before. But the bridge has to be the living room syndrome. It has to be comfortable and familiar. And that's simply the thinking behind it. I'm very flattered when people want to see the sets. But you have to remember. It doesn't exist. It really don't exist. And also the sets are taken down. Yeah, and then put yeah. back up other other times. Like the bridge will always be a standing set. It's simply too big to take down once it's up. But all those other rooms, they're all temporary because I need to make room for the next set. If I need a transporter room, a sick bay, that has to occupy the same space as where they stood. So it's a rotational thing. I try to keep the supplies the same so when I reconstruct it, it looks the same. The same, yeah. But that's why I said there's really nothing to visit. Or you would be very disappointed because you'd be amazed how tiny it looks or how cheap it looks. And I don't mean that in a bad way. You just, you know, if you really want to see amazing sets, go, you know, go to the go to the big guns. That's really? worth your time. Uh, my little basement, I think you'd journey a long way and maybe be amused for a few moments. But you'd shake your head and say, eh, I don't think that was worth the journey, you know, <laughs> because uh, and I'm being honest, you know, it's just we are no budget filmmaking. It says as no money as you can get. And, uh, but I am proud of my stories. I'm proud of my cast. I'm proud of what we do. And again, nobody has to think about it. It's not their job to think about it, but making these episodes with no money, it, it's, it's a Herculean task. If you think about it. For sure. You know? I mean, and I mean, you know, well, you should be, you should be proud of your stories, bro. You have amazing stories. People love your stories. They love the stories, you know? Um, thank you. You know, I, I I dare think of what life will be like when there is no more Antillas to watch. 
Oh. Uh, or new new episodes. I guess that will always be in Tell Us to Watch. Is you know, yeah. more new episodes coming out. Like any any great, you know, like like Q says, you know, all, like all good things, you know. Yeah. Um, but I guess my my question is, how much time do I have left? Um, my question is, uh, man, you went through some health issues. You've had to move. Right. Lost in the family. Season three is definitely on the horizon, and there might be even more trek past that. Right. Why is it still, still, after, I mean, it's been a couple of years since it's been on the podcast. Why is it still so important to keep, to keep, keep, keep to keep doing this? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, on the one hand, it would be fair to say you're still playing in someone else's, uh, you know, uh, universe. That, yeah, universe. Uh, because I didn't invent Star Trek. Uh, so why do you keep making variations on a theme? Uh, and that's a very fair criticism. Uh, but I will say that it just gives me such joy to do it. For all the work, for all the problems, for all the things, it's it's a it's a place that I just love playing in. It's a sandbox. That's the word I was looking for. It's the sandbox I love playing in because it brings me such joy. And in my own way, whether nobody else accepts it i like adding to the tapestry of, of the trek universe i just like to put in my two cents um but again you have to ultimately do it for yourself and it, it sounds selfish but you cannot make any product for the masses because you're never going to please everyone it's a losing battle you can only hope that whatever you come up with enough people say hey you know that that puts a smile on my face i'm enjoying that or that's a good story or that's a good message that's that's all you can hope for but that's out of your hands. So all I can do is try to come up with interesting stories and characters. And uh, and, and and let's be completely honest here, Trey. Suppose I, I left Star Trek, right? And I created my own show. We'll call it like uh, Rocket Ship uh, Trey. Rocket Ship Trey. <laughs> and it's got all new characters. It's nothing to do with Star Trek, but it's you know still a science fiction show uh, about a, a, a spaceship that explores and visits alien worlds. You know what would happen? You'd never get the audience that Trek has. Trek has a built-in, how many decades Fandom. now? Fandom. And the thing is, whether they love or hate you, they're, they're willing to give you a shot. I've noticed out of all my non-Star Trek projects, if you look at the numbers, nothing comes close to the numbers I pull in with Star Trek. Now, I don't, if this was merely vanity, then fine. You know, like, oh, I know I'm going to get numbers, so I'll just keep doing Star Trek. But that's really not the point. I would love to do 100% original stuff, you know, nothing to do with, with something that's been already established. And I do that. I do that through my short films. I actually have a couple of short films I'm going to be working on after Antillus. Um, like My my Man in the Hallway, Man in the Hallway, uh, Murder Will Out, Honor Bound, all completely original, all from my head. But you won't get those numbers. You would, you won't even come close uh, to the, and it's same amount of work in a way, you know, you're putting your heart or and soul more. into it or mm -hmm. more. Um, so, you know, you want your work to be seen, you want it to be enjoyed. And so it's a win-win for me with Trek. I love Star Trek just for myself. And I love sharing Star Trek because people seem to enjoy it. But yeah, it's, um, it's the reason why I keep coming back to the well, because it's still tasty. You know, if I get to the point where, uh, I get bored of it, or I feel I can't say or add anything new, um, then I'll walk away. And every single Star Trek I've ever done was always going to be the last thing in Star Trek. When I did Infinite Chain, last thing that was going to be it. When I did uh, Incident at Beta 9, last that, thing. I said, oh, I answered the Klingon question. I'm happy. I'm done. <laughs> then the Final Darkness, I said, oh, I'll make a trilogy out of this. I can carry over some characters, have some fun with it, and also wrap up Captain Navarro's storyline that, you know, kind of, I said, you know, I want to see where she ends up. So that's so, it. So that was it. I did my trilogy. And that's why so many years went by between the end of the trilogy and my series, because I really had no intention of doing this. And then, um, and then I was like, I, I want to do, I never did a series. Like I know the, the trilogy is interconnected, but I mean a series, a one story told over X amount of episodes, you know, a beginning, middle and end. And I like that challenge. I, I said, I got. I have no money. I don't know how I'm going to do this. But again, I always like a challenge. It's some new little spin on it. So it's not just doing the same thing you've always done. And that's basically where Intellis came from. It just became 
a challenge. And again, remember, originally it was 10 to 15 episodes. Mm -hmm. But as I started rolling up my sleeves, saying, I, I think I'll stay a little bit longer, 20 episodes. And then it made sense that each season would be 10 episodes. I kind of like the cleanness of it, for the most part. I know I said I, I might make 12, but who cares at that point? If you need to have two extra yeah. episodes, it's the end. So it's the end of Adilis in one way. Um, but but I'm, I'm just saying now, it doesn't mean you might never see these characters again in future projects. Mm -hmm. Might not be until a series, but I'm not saying that you won't see some of these familiar faces ever again. But uh, as I get closer to the end of Antillus, Trey, I'll keep you in the loop. I don't want to make any uh, solid announcements yet because just too much is on the table right now. Once the table starts getting cleared, then I can see more into the next chapter, whatever that might be. In other words, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the series to come to an end and for that sweet sweet movie deal you know <laughs> to, to, to begin i'm thinking what like a trilogy at least right um <laughs> or we'll see where we're at. all right so um well i'll tell you what where we're at i have just a few questions just a oh, couple hey. questions for anya really oh, yeah. um you know uh goodness we spent we spent the whole time talking to talking to george you know talking to your dad um just so that you know we'll, we'll make them really quick um any plans to take over the the whole shebang uh when he's finally going to be done with it or are you going to literally do your own thing or you just feel like you know what i am going to do my own thing and i'm not going to do any of that uh, both i definitely follow in his footsteps i do a million things at a time but i would love to take over because you know She's, she's yeah. actually a better filmmaker at her age than I could ever have been. You know, where I kind of started around 13, 14 years old. She's way younger than that. And it's it's fun to see how much she knows, the knowledge that's in her head. She's If you give her the right tools and the right cast, she could make a better film. <laughs> she really could because she's young and just, I think any problems that came her way, she would be able to overcome them, you know? I think I started editing at eight. Yeah. So it's been and a while. Good editing too, not just... <laughs> Yeah, I like it. Um, are right, will we see you in the Antilles series as a non-sharp character? Uh, who knows? <laughs> I think it's a good possibility. I mean, she's starting. To, I mean, like I said, she's like literally growing up like a weed, like like <laughs> yeah. in the past couple of years. Um. Well, Wait. the timeless daughter's storyline's got to be answered, you know, and played out. Timeless. The timeless Very daughter, yeah, timeless. yeah. So we're running out of time for the timeless daughter, but uh, uh, yeah. So yeah, you will see her outside of the sharp uh, character. Uh, it's essential. If you take over, if you follow in your father's footsteps, will you ever go back and revisit any of his previous projects? Yeah, I mean. It depends on when everything's wrapped up. Once he's done with everything, when I, you know, whatever, how old I am, how old he is, you know, it really depends. You know, I don't know if I'll go back to Antilles growing up, you know, like take over, but I might go back to some of his um, less or known projects or um, continue anything he may have started and scrapped. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, along the way, it's like the, what, what is the classic thing? You have to break a few eggs to make the omelet. So I have a lot of projects that, uh, as I get older, these pieces of projects, they're kind of intriguing me a little bit, like, hey, maybe I can finish them up. You know, it'll be different than what I originally intended. But, you know, there's some gold in the hills, as they say, you know. And so, um, and they're completely original, too. They're nothing to do with Star Trek. Uh, more Twilight Zone-ish in vibes than anything else, which is another one of my favorite all-time show. Uh, uh, the other part of the philosophy, Trey, I, uh, maybe you'll agree, is you don't want to overstay your welcome. As an artist, whenever we had a portfolio and you had to show people to get a job, you used to always say, leave them wanting more. Don't show them so much work that they're like, okay, I've seen it all. I don't want... So I think within Tillis, 30, say 30 episodes, maybe 32, that's a pretty nice chunk of work. Um, long enough to, to endear, hopefully, you know, you'll, you'll love it, but not so long as, oh God, they should have ended this a long time ago. Um, I think it's important to know when to walk away. Um, cause yeah, you could do it until it's theoretically, well, it depends on your story forever, you know, until I'm 90, but 
that's not what I envision the story to be, you know, as to whether someone else could take over the Intellos, like a future captain. Maybe that's the starting point for a new show or whatever, you know, but um, I will say this without giving anything away. Uh, there is a fate to Captain Allen that you will learn about by the end of the third season. There, there is a definitive end. And whether that means he could continue as captain or not, you know, you'll see. But I think I think it's a good I think it's a good amount of work to do, you know. And again, if season three ends up being twelve, thirteen episodes, fourteen episodes, it would only because it would only be because uh, it's the story I wanted to tell. And you know, sometimes things just take a little bit longer than you think. You, you know, oh maybe episode you know uh, twenty three was supposed to wrap that up, but you know what? I I need more. You know, so I needed to have that flexibility. It's not that I'm being um, disingenuous. It's just that ultimately I got to serve my story, and if it needs two extra episodes, I I can't say I'm bankrolling it, but I'll I'll give myself that luxury, you know, to do it. I want I I'm terrified that people won't think I stuck the I stuck the landing, you know. That's the hardest thing. You have all this momentum, and I don't want people to be like, uh, oh, oh, all right, whatever. It just fizzled out. So I'm cognizant of the expectations, and but the good news is I wrote the story already. So that takes a little bit of pressure off. I don't have to figure out where I'm going with it. I just have to stick the landing, do it well enough and consistent enough that, you know, even if you don't like it, that's okay. But it has to be consistent. It can't look like, you know what I'm saying? I can't suddenly visit, you know, Starbase 66 Studios or something, you know, like, and here's the intelligence of my last episode. It, it just wouldn't make any sense, you know, unless the captain got invited to the Enterprise or something. You know, that would be the only exception if you ever saw me in those sets, that the captain is not on the Intellis, he's on the, you know, the Enterprise or whatever, then I could do it because it wouldn't interfere with the consistency of my show, you know. That I that 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 would be the only uh, exception. I like it. I like it. Well, George, let's go ahead and knock out these. Uh, and Anya, let's go ahead yeah. and knock out these quick fire questions, and sure. then. Uh, and then we'll call uh, Core Matter with Anya and George, or George and Anya. Uh, 2023 done, right? Um, here we go with Quick Fire. Star Trek or Star Wars? Star Trek. Yeah, Star Trek. Favorite Star Trek captain? Kirk. Favorite Star Trek movie? Rathacon. Rathacon, yeah. Favorite Star Trek series? Original. Oh, the original TOS. Favorite Star Trek. What did I say? Ship. Enterprise. Uh, yeah. uh, I, it's a. T it's almost a tie between the original series Enterprise and the Enterprise Next. A. You know, for the Next. for the movies. Yeah. Well, you know. Yep. Yeah. Um, and finally, uh, favorite Star Trek character. What's that? I have to say Spock. For me personally, although Kirk is right up there, it's like trying to pick your favorite Beatles. It's tough, mm -hmm. but I would have to say if I had to give you a definitive answer, Spock is my favorite. I don't even know. <laughs> wow! Wow! All right, both y'all, give me a big Vulcan salute. There we go. Oh, I didn't ask the most important question. You guys got to come back. This was how much you guys come back? I care in about six months. What do you say? Yeah, no, that's, that's fine as long as you're not tired of us. You know, that's fine. I'll never be tired of dude. That we. <laughs> We dedicated an entire day to these two. We call it K and Friday, right here on the Max World <laughs> yeah. Entertainment YouTube channel. You can check it out 8 p.m. Central Daylight Time. Uh, otherwise, you can check uh, George out down the link down below. All right, I'm going to hit this button right here. Hold on. Thanks, uh, Trey. Wait, Thanks, wait, 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 wait. Thanks to everyone. There you go. There you go. And say goodbye. Say goodbye. And... Bye. You know, I'm always so thankful that anyone wants to share any amount of time with me here on my channel and my podcast, right? I'm even more hum humbled so, more so, that they that they open up about like, you know, health issues like the way they, that George did, right? Like, wow. Like, man, I'm going to tell you right now. Thank you, brother. Like, seriously, thank you so much. And, like, seriously, to both you and to Anya, right? You know, we cannot wait for uh, 
can't wait for more Antilles, right? So we're so excited. We're kind of sad that to hear that, I guess, that the story is finally coming to a close. But like, you know, uh, like you said to uh, Picard that one time, I guess all good things must come to an end. And with that being said, that's all the time we got for Core Matter. Until next week, I'll see you next time. Please be safe and good to one another. And of course, if this was your first time here and you liked what you saw, make sure you become a subscriber. Hit that little bell to the all notification so you don't miss out on the very next episode of Core Matter. And of course, I'm not going to forget about my amazing patrons or channel members that literally have helped me achieve not only milestones that I never thought were even possible, but like seriously, like lifelong dreams of mine. Uh, of course, those amazing patrons are Betty S, Alan A, Eli I, Jeff B, Darren M, PJW, Michelle M, CW Thompson, Lynn Marie P, Kevin B, Paul O, and Doug G. Guys, girls, thank you. You were with me at some of you were with me at the very beginning before anything else and uh you helped me make a lot of things happen so thank you and of course another amazing group of people that literally have not only helped continue to help make things happen for me but have kept this channel going have kept the podcast alive um have kept you know the the fire even in myself you know burning bright are jeff higdon jeremy burton the rv dj william jackson for her the boss Celia Phantom Hive, Double D, Duffy 60, Raymar 3D, Scott Johnson, JP, Bounty Hunter, Douglas Grady, PJ White, Christopher Holiday, Claude Sailing, Hondell, Dr. Jones Savage, Captain Fandom Nerd, JP RPH1, Eldritch Lord Haster, David Wren, Usarn G, Alan Anderson, Mark R. Largent, Jeff B., Troy Pacelli, Nutters Network, Adam Vera, The Catman, a.k.a. Dee Dee Myers, Pyrophoric, Warlords of Trek, and Lady Miss. Guys, girls, thank you for everything that you do. You guys and gals are amazing. I'll see you in the next episode of Core Matter.